Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and I'm, I'm bringing you kind of a big mix of information today. If you are an XRP holder, I think it's going to be most interesting for you. I promised to keep an eye on SWIFT with their recent announcement on the cross-border payments, specifically that new platform that they announced where they're going to have this focus on low value, high volume payments. And that's the same sweet spot that Ripple is zeroing in on. And the architecture we now know from the Cybos announcement is a database platform, not blockchain. And it's going to be built by Oracle. And they're not talking too much about interoperability in this narrative. In fact, <laughs> quite the opposite. You can see here that I have this highlighted quote, we see great potential for banks that are competing against fintechs and alternate networks when it comes to cross-border payments, Sunny Singh said. He is the Oracle Financial Services Executive Vice President. So he believes he's bringing a solution that lets them compete. Well, I wanted to do a search to see if Ripple had the possibility of integrating with Oracle, and I can find many archived articles, blogs, and tweets from October 2018 with a reference to Marcus Treacher of Ripple explaining how the Ripple API can do that. But the link which all of those sources gave is now dark. It's a video on YouTube that was taken private. So I'm sorry, I can't show you that video. If anybody has it, archived. I'd love to see it. And uh, just go ahead and give me a heads up uh, on Twitter. Now, this is really interesting. This is another Cybos TV. It was about advancing cross-border payments. I listened to the whole thing twice, actually. And it seemed, I mean, there were so many parts I wanted to show you. I even saw uh, what was it, Jenna? One trick on Twitter took out a portion of it. And I wanted you to listen to Victoria Cleland. She's the executive director of banking for, for England, the Bank of England. Uh, she was talking about the enormous market size of which this space is growing to. And all of a sudden, when I was just setting it up for the right place to play for you, the video was pulled. <laughs> so I don't know, somebody must have said something that didn't sit well with somebody because they have now made this video unavailable. Well, the one part that I can be sure to remember is that Victoria said that from 2017 to 2027, there was going to be an additional 100 trillion in cross-border remittances. It's going to grow to 253 trillion. So this market is just enormous. And there is going to be two new people. They're not new to Ripple, but they're new in terms of their new job description. Oh, that's Miko. No, 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 Miko, come on over here. They're, they are going to be busy trying to grab some of that market share. And that's Ashish Birla, who is the new GM for RippleNet, and Monica Long. She is going to be the new GM for Ripple X, which was previously called Spring. That was announced by Brad Garlinghouse on October 6th. And we can go to this link that gives us a little bit more explanation on Ripple Insights. And Ashish Birla is going to have ODL under his wing. That's the on-demand liquidity that XRP provides RippleNet. The one portion of this Ripple Insights that I found uh, exciting is that it talks about RippleNet's competitive advantage will come to life at Ripple Swell Global. We have basically a countdown of about six days. So that event uh, is going to unite RippleNet customers, partners, and industry leaders who are committed to changing the way money moves globally. Yeah, come to life. I want to see that. <laughs> and then October 6th, uh, or 8th rather, talking about Ashish Birla, he was in this 
panel discussion and um, it was good. It's it's really good. I should put a link to it in the description below, especially if you are an XLM holder. This is Lisa Nestor. She is the senior strategist for for uh, Stellar, and she did do a lot of talking. But the portion I want to play for you is coming from Ashish, and he's talking about how you know Mr. Garlinghouse and and Mr. Eldorati and Chris Larson have been talking about how that the United States has been so difficult with regulation, but it is even beyond regulation. It's getting just set up in the U.S. is a nightmare, according to Ashish Birla. And I want you to hear him talk about how, uh, you know, the lack of this token guidance and the clear um, regulations and also having to go through all the 50 different states um, with all their individual hoops to jump through. Yeah, it's a nightmare. And I'll end with this. You're going to also start to see new asset types. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that to be clear, I mean, the United States has not been uh, forward thinking with fintech regulation. Yeah, are you guys considering uh, leaving the U.S.? Well, I mean, the, the point being is that, like, look at what it takes to start a fintech in the United States. I have to go to 50 states. I have to get licenses. That's $2 million in legal fees and, and all that. So, you know, my hard-earned VC money, I know it's cheap these days, Frank, but that $2 million is, is <laughs> all my snacks, budget, gone. So <laughs> it, it's tough to, to even get started here. Meanwhile, you go to the UK, um, MAS in Singapore, really clear fintech regulation for non-banks. They have, they've got really good, you know, token guidance. Uh, in both the UK and in Singapore, they they are screaming for companies to set up uh, there by providing clear regulation. And by the way, that they're stealing that from the United States' playbook with the internet. I mean, I, I walk down my street, I see I see you know you know top brands, uh, you know Uber, Airbnb, and 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 Google and and so forth all started here because clear regulation paved the way. The rest of the world followed. And that's the exact opposite that's happening here with uh, with not only you know digital asset and blockchain, but also you know fintech. It's it's a nightmare to be honest to get things set up. And with blockchain being borderless and this new world of work from wherever you you know you can, I mean, if you're a new entrepreneur in this space, a blockchain space, I'm not going to say that the best idea right now is to uh, you know get get set up in uh, you know Sand Hill or Silicon Valley. Wow. Yeah, I think, um, I hope they move their headquarters. I, I really do. I think that um, the so-called letter that came from the OCC didn't go far enough. Um, e even though some people think that the United States is making progress, you have to understand that this letter that did come from Brian Brooks, it is addressing only the support of tokens that are backed on a one-to-one -one basis by a single fiat currency. It did nothing for XRP, nothing at all. So I think that when you just take a look at like what Singapore is able to do, this is something that came out on the 5th of October, and it is the stable coin that is backed by the Singapore dollar. This is the first travel rule compliant set out clearly through regulations by the Monetary Authority of Singapore through its notice PSN01 on their transfer requirements. So this is, you know, this is what everybody's talking about. Um, the United States is behind in its clarity. Now let's talk a little bit about CBDCs, shall we? I love this image. Central Bank Digital Currencies. At Cybos, 24 hours ago, a delegate was discussing these CBDCs and they agreed that only, actually less than 5% of the cross-border payments will, are, will be conducted by CBDCs in the next five years. So it's a very, very small portion. 43% agreed that it would take 10 years. 
So maybe all this focus for XRP bridging these is a little bit too early to spend too much time talking about. That is just my thought talking out loud there. I think we're spending a little bit too much focus on this if it's only going to be that small amount. I'd rather talk about things that are going to have a bigger impact. So the discussion really, when you talk about the U.S. being behind, maybe what I would point to is mobile payments. The U.S. ranks sixth in the world, and it's sixth by a lot. Americans are still using cards. They're just really hooked to their debit cards and their credit cards. And only 11 million households, only 11 million households are expected to scan a QR code for any sort of payment by the end of 2020. That is just, my gosh, just almost nothing at all. Especially, you know, if I come back down, just show you here on these stats, 1.65 trillion worth of transactions on a QR code are going to come out of China. Oh, wow. wow, wow, wow. Okay, here's another, oh my gosh, I got bombarded with this link in my DMs on Twitter. It's the quantum.gov. And this new website is really nothing more than a new site that's funded by the NITRD. This is the Network of Information Technology Research and Development Program. It's a federally funded R&D entity that's been around for like 20 years. Its members include the military services, all four branches, the National Institute of Health, uh, NOAA, which is the National Oceanic a Atmospheric Administration, uh, the National Science Foundation. What they're focused on, their efforts are focused on AI, cybersecurity, big data, robotics, that kind of focus. And what I really found the most interesting is that their funding is down this last year. All right. So I went out to see if I could find anything about SBI and their acquisition of Tau, Tau which is the exchange that was picked up and now wholly owned by the SBI group. And I um, was just so curious because that was the exchange that CZ at Binance was trying to do a partnership with so that he could enter Japan. And the fact that when the negotiations failed and SBI announced their acquisition, it really just left me with kind of my jaw down. <laughs> what? <laughs> because it is, yeah, the fourth exchange that SBI has either uh, invested into or picked up 100% or started. And so um, I couldn't find anything except this is a little bit interesting. There's an SBI auction on the blockchain, and there were 340 some lots that came up for auction just a couple of days ago. And one big surprise was this image here. I don't know how you feel about it, but it was expected to bring 14,000 US dollars around, but the realized price fetched a bit over 477,000 US dollars. Wow, what a big surprise. And there is um, the diary of the prime minister that is printed every day in the business uh, media. And it kind of talks about where he's been and who his appointments with. And we did uh, learn that on October 5th, he went to eat at the Okura Hotel in Toronto with uh, Mr. Kitao of SBI. So they were at the hotel together uh, eating, and they were eating at the Orchid Bar, which is one of the most uh, interesting places to go to if you like classic bars in Tokyo. I have only been there once, and the crowd was, I can tell you, the crowd was 
quite something. And there were a lot of foreigners too. Um, the crowd was the best for me. I was sitting, there's, there's a, some seats over here on the, on the left up against the wall. It's not that wide. It's, it's kind of long and narrow. And, uh, the people sitting at the bar, I, I just have this real vivid memory. It was, uh, it, quite interesting. Anyway, the, they were, uh, having a meal together in the bar. Yeah, they have a full, they have a full menu there. I think I had a smoked salmon when I, when I went. Anyway, um, so this is a good thing. What I'm trying to get to in trans, in transforming to the fluff here is that, um, Mr. Kitao, of course, is such a bull when it comes to the digital transformation. And the fact that he has this ear of the prime minister is going to be a good thing for, Japan, I do believe. So I did put out this tweet. I'm getting into the fluff now. This is a new car that is on patrol for traffic in Japan, and it is a very fancy Lexus. Look at that. But after I put that up on my Twitter feed, somebody showed me a police car coming from Italy with a Ferrari. <laughs> I said, yo, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, that definitely is one up over the Lexus. Gosh, look at that beautiful blue. It's almost like a, a lilac. It's really, really gorgeous. And then the little bit of fluff I wanted to share with you is that um, in this digitization, we are going through so many changes. And one of the big changes is going to be the the loss of the Honko. And the Honko is a um, name stamp. So anytime you have to do any official paperwork in Japan, and this is going to end very soon, you have to use a stamp. Mine is from an artisan that is um, like a 13 generation uh, craftsman that have been making Honko since the Edo period. And uh, I, 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 I'm going to be really sad that I don't have to take this to do any official paperwork anymore because um, they're going to do away with the requirement of having the stamp with all of the paper in this new digitization. Oh, yeah, I'm going to miss it. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.